Hello everyone, this is Deb Kerstead. I'm your Connections Coordinator here at Canyon Lake United Methodist Church, and we are so happy to welcome you to worship today. If you wouldn't mind, would you please type your name in the comments below? We would love to be able to welcome you, say hello to each other. It's kind of our way of greeting each other online, and so we would love to know who is here today and who is watching from home. We also ask that during our prayer time today, if you do have prayer requests or things that you would like to share with us, please type those into the comments during our prayer time as well. So we are so glad that you are here today. Welcome to worship. Hey Canyon Lake, welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Brett. I'm your teaching pastor here. And I'm Pastor Dion. I am the lead pastor here at Canyon Lake. And we're so glad to welcome you to worship today. It's a gift to have you all with us as we get to explore uh, what it is to be made new in Christ. So friends, let's start worshiping together and join together in our call to worship. We gather to worship God who creates us and loves us, who gifts us with diversity and makes us for community, who inspires us to seek justice, share power and live together in love. We gather to worship God who invites us to join the journey toward wholeness and, and well-being for all and whose presence Grace and love sustain us in our living. Friends, let's sing together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. In us we pray Unveil why we're made Come set your hearts ablaze With hope like wildfire In our very souls Holy Spirit come Invade us now We are your church We need your power Change the atmosphere. 
Children's Ministry Coordinator, and today we're talking about something that's kind of sad. Have you ever hurt someone? Like, maybe somebody asked to play with you and you said no. That kind of thing really hurts feelings, doesn't it? Or maybe you got really upset and you pushed or hit someone. That actually hurts their body. And then there's always those times when we call people names. And again, that really hurts their feelings, and a Band-Aid is not going to fix it. Okay, here's my second question. After you hurt this person, what did you do next? Did you just walk away and it was over? Or did you try to help that person? Maybe get them a Band-Aid, help them up, go get help, say you're sorry. I hope that's what you did. You see, we all make mistakes, don't we? And it's important that when we make mistakes, that we try to fix them. Okay, last question. After you helped that person, is it now over? You said you're sorry and it's over. You just forget about it and you just walk away and hopefully you learn from your mistake and you don't do it again. I mean, that is good. I, I don't want you to do it again, but I don't want you to forget about it. I want you to learn from your mistake and then be on the lookout because now you know that that's not okay and you know how that person felt. So now you want to be on the lookout for other people that that might be happening to too. Keep a lookout for the people that are hurting or about to get hurt and go help them. This is called being an upstander because you're not standing on the side. Being a bystander, you're standing up for them and being an upstander. Does that make sense? Joe always tells me stories about when he plays soccer at school. And it's really hard because he has all of these wonderful friends that he plays soccer with and he wants to be their friend. But sometimes he sees things happening that aren't good things. People being left out, people being made fun of when they don't make a goal people being made fun of when they don't kick right, or maybe they don't know the rules. And I'm so proud that Joe understands and recognizes that that is not good. And several times this year, he's come home and told me, Mom, I stood up for so-and-so and made sure that everybody else knew that it was not okay to make fun of them for that. Or, Mom, they were leaving out so-and-so, and so we went and played our own game by ourselves. These are all really good examples of times when you can be an upstander and help others. This is not easy, but I know that you have the courage and the bravery to do it. You just got to keep your eye out. And remember, I'm there for you and so is God. Have a great week. Thank you, Erin. And now as we enter into our time of prayer together, let's be mindful that God is always here. It's we who forget to be still so that we can connect with God. So let's do that now as we begin with this song. There is no one like you, there is none this 
Pray with me. Loving God, thank you for this time of worship where we can be still and remember that we are yours and that you love us so completely, so fully, that you long for us to know what it means to step more and more into the new life that you offer to us and that life that you offer to all of your children. So God, today give us ears to hear and an open heart the message that you have for us. Help us to step more fully into the new life you give to us. Help us to care deeply about the new life that you offer to others as well. Show us, God, where are the parts in our lives where we need to help make things right so that others may more fully experience your life and grace. Remind us, God, that we're all in this together. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So how many of you have ever sung that song that goes, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he? It was one of my favorites as a kid. And, and if you grew up in the church or ever went to camp, you've probably sung it too. Uh, well, today we are looking at the story of that wee little man, Zacchaeus, um, in, in Luke. Uh, but to make sense of it, before we read the scripture, to make sense of it, we've got to sort of back up about half a chapter uh, for me to tell you about an encounter that Jesus had. So in Luke chapter 18, Jesus encounters a, a rich ruler. He was someone who followed all of the religious laws, and he asked Jesus what would be necessary for eternal life. And Jesus told him he needed to, to sell all he owned and give all of the money to the poor. Now, like most of us probably, he didn't particularly want to do that. And so he went away from Jesus sad. And I want you to keep that story in, in mind as we read Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And, and I'll sort of explain why on the other side. So here's what's in Luke 19. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and, and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and, and said to the Lord, look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and save the lost. Now Zacchaeus's story is told in contrast to that story of the rich ruler. The rich ruler was like a, a religious model. He was the one who always gave money to the church, taught Sunday school, never missed worship, served in leadership roles. You, you know the type that I'm trying to explain. If anyone's saved, everyone assumes that it's him. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, was a traitor. He was working alongside the Romans and basically made his living stealing money from other people. So right away, we're supposed to be sympathetic to the rich ruler and, and suspicious of Zacchaeus. And yet it's Zacchaeus to whom Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. As I was looking at these two stories, the, the difference that really struck me is that the rich ruler encountered Jesus but didn't change. And Zacchaeus encountered Jesus and did change. Specifically, Zacchaeus made restitution for his wrong doings. And that's our theme for today, restitution, which is really just a fancy word for saying making things right again. To really and truly take part in the resurrected life, we've got to allow God to change us, to become new people and to live into that new life every day by making our wrongs right. That's what Zacchaeus did. He says, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Zacchaeus wants to make things right, to restore things to the way they're supposed to be, the way Jesus reveals they ought to be. And in the gospels, particularly in Luke, the way Jesus shows things ought to be is people caring for the poor, seeking justice, people aligning themselves with the oppressed and the powerless. Zacchaeus sees this and, and how he's failing to live into the life that Jesus has modeled. And so he changes his ways. 
He decides to refuse to prioritize his own wealth over the needs of his neighbors, his own comfort over justice for others. And, and it doesn't come across as clearly in the English translation, but the Greek that's used here in Zacchaeus' statement is, is one that is unending. It's this ongoing action, this whole and continuous life change. Much like Zacchaeus modeled, y'all, living in the kingdom of God, living the resurrection life is a whole process of allowing God to continually change us so that we can make what's wrong right so that we can shift what's not of God toward reflecting God's image, so that we can can offer, can be bearers of new life. And, And one of the ways this happens is on an intimate, personal level, right? So so imagine with me for just a second the humility that it would have required Zacchaeus to go back into a community who who hated him. And for him to say, hey, I have gotten this so wrong, and I am so sorry. Let me make it right. There had to be so much fear and shame there, and, and maybe you've felt that way before. When you just know that you've messed up big and and you want to make amends and seek forgiveness, but the fear and the shame and the embarrassment is just overwhelming. You can't even imagine looking the person you've wronged in the eye again. I have been there. So many times I've been there. And and if you're anything like me, then then maybe you've just kind of walked away, buried your head in the sand and thought, "It'll, it'll blow over. And then just waited for time to pass and offer its healing. But y'all, when I do that, when we do that, We miss out on the kingdom of God. We miss out on on fully participating in the riches of our own salvation right now. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. Now as United Methodists, we believe that salvation is a process that begins the moment we choose to respond to God. The moment that we allow ourselves to be changed by God's grace. It's not that salvation's caused by anything we do, but when we receive its gift, we are changed. And when we're truly changed by God's grace, when we're living in the fullness of our salvation, our new life that we have in Christ, we start making things right. Be bold, y'all. Walk through and past the fear and shame and guilt with humility, knowing that we'll be better humans and Christians and neighbors on the other side. Be bold and know that in our admission of our failures and making right what we've messed up, in doing that, we show the world God. Be bold. And know that it's not just about us personally either. This act of living lives, continually being made new and offering restitution is something that is so much bigger than us. It affects every single system and institution that we're a part of too. To live into Jesus' new life as Zacchaeus did, we've got to be willing to let God change us to our core and then be willing to use those new lives to change our relationships, our church, our communities, our world, and even our families into ones that are oriented toward God's justice and love. Because this, our, our salvation, our transformation, our new lives, they aren't just about us. There's freedom for us, absolutely, but there's so much freedom for others, too, if only we're willing to share it. This is hard, y'all, because it requires a willingness to hear God's truth 
and then speak it into people and systems who might not be ready to hear it too. It requires a willingness to see injustice and oppression and harm for what it really is and then dare to do the work to make it right even when it's hard and scary and uncomfortable and when it would be so much easier to just avoid it all. Y'all, we are experiencing a deep push right now to bow to the idols of avoidance and unity at all cost. There's a narrative in our country and denomination and in our own families that we need to just all get along and avoid addressing anything that, that could be uncomfortable or hard. But let me tell you, restitution is almost never comfortable or easy. But there can be no full Christian unity if there are still wrongs that we need to make right. Unity or getting along or avoiding conflict in and of themselves means absolutely nothing unless it's unity within the goodness of the kingdom of God. Unity in getting along and avoiding conflict in and of themselves mean absolutely nothing unless it is unity in the goodness of the kingdom of God. And that doesn't mean that we need to rush into conflict just for conflict's sake. It doesn't mean that we can't be diverse or have differences of opinions. Some of our biggest growth comes when we disagree with people well. Those things are beautiful and I'd, I'd never want to stifle them in any way. But over and over and over again, our scripture says that the kingdom of God is a place of justice of forgiveness and restitution, of, of healing, peace, love, and transformation. And so if we unite ourselves around anything, anything that doesn't come with Jesus' justice, healing, peace, love, and transformation at the center of it all, then I want no part of it because it's not of God. If our unity where our conflict avoidance comes at the cost of our siblings of color or our LGBTQ plus siblings or women or those with disabilities or, or other oppressed people, then I want no part of it because it's not of God. Salvation life. Resurrection life in the Gospel of Luke and in Zacchaeus' story in particular is about a revolution of the heart that emboldens us to do the hard work, to make revolutionary changes in ourselves and in our world. That kind of salvation, that kind of new life is knocking on the door of this house today and we get to choose. The, the choice is ours, y'all. We get to choose. Will we be like the rich ruler who walks away or will we get to hear Jesus say, today salvation has come to this house and then decide to immerse our whole lives in it? Will we ignore and avoid the harm we've caused others, the broken relationships that still need healing or will we make amends in our personal lives and live in a wholly new way? Y'all, we've met God and encountered God's grace. And so now we get to decide if we'll walk in the new life. Will we keep silent in the face of, of racism in our country, offering only platitudes or excuses? Or will we offer restitution and healing for the ways that we have been complicit? We've met God. We've encountered God's grace. And so now we get to decide if we'll walk in the new life. Will we hoard our money in fear or will we feed the neighbor who's hungry now? Y'all, we've met God. We've encountered God's grace. And so now we get to choose if we will walk in the new life. Will we be content with the way the church has always been and who the church has always welcomed? Or will we dare to apologize to those we've kept out 
Will we make it right? Admit our wrongs, our sin, and boldly and loudly open our doors wide. Y'all, we have met God. We've encountered God's grace. And so now we get to choose if we'll walk in the new life. Friends, offering restitution, making our lives and our world right, is a process that happens on a, on a deeply personal level and a systemic level. And we can't ignore either. And the bad news is that it's hard and never-ending work. There will always be things for which we need to make amends. There will always be systems that need called out and changed. And sometimes there'll be the places and the things we love. That's the bad news. But the good news, the good news is that it's in that hard work. In allowing God to walk with us and change us from the inside out, that we get to experience the fullness of our new life. The salvation life, the resurrection life is sitting here before us today, and we can choose to live in it. We can choose to show the world Jesus. We can choose to work with God and each other to offer restitution and, and to participate in making the world new. It's not easy, but it is surely the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful thing that we could ever take part in. There's nothing more rewarding or life-giving than seeing more and more of God's children, including ourselves, experiencing the liberation that comes with being welcomed to God's table and walking into a transformed life more fully. And so y'all, my prayer is that we may be bold, that we may do the hard things, have the hard conversations and let God make the hard changes in us so that God can use us to change the whole world into a place that looks like the kingdom of heaven here on earth. May salvation life, may resurrection life come to this house today. will
is such a great song. And that takes us into our giving time. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, it helps us to be a, a life-giving place where we can make a difference in the lives of youth and children and adults in our community, in our church, and around the world. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, one of the best ways you can do that is by, uh, is by going online and hopping on our website and finding the the Give tab on our homepage. You can also drop a check in the mail or stop by the church office. We love to see you. And we want to let you know about something exciting that is happening uh, in May. It's the end of the year, end of the school year bash that we do every year out at Storm Mountain Center. And this is a fun time for our children, our youth, their families, and for everyone in our church. And I know Pastor Brett is super excited about it because um, being out in nature is the, like the most awesome thing. Yes, it is. Yeah, yes. uh, I'm, I'm so excited to uh, smell the ponderosa trees, to enjoy a cookout together, to go hiking, and then to have a campfire worship with s'mores. It's a wonderful time with our church family. I hope you'll put it on the calendar. It's Wednesday, May 12th from 530 to 730. It's actually the s'mores uh, that's going to get me there. Yeah, yeah It's not right. the hiking, but the s'mores. You yep. can't turn that down. That's right. uh, Y'all, thank you so much for being here in worship with us today. We are so glad to have you here and, and as a part of Canyon Lake. As you go forth from this place, may you go forth knowing that we are called to do hard things. Because sometimes it's in the challenge that we see and we share God the most. Y'all, as you go forth, may you go knowing that God's grace, that God's love, and that God's transformation goes with you every single step of the way. We hope you have an amazing week, and thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Justice and praise become my